I want to thank the International Surgical Sleep Society for giving me an opportunity to bring you this presentation on myofunctional therapy and lingual frenuloplasty. My name is Sarush Zaghi. I'm a graduate of Harvard Medical School. I did my ENT residency at UCLA and then completed the Sleep Surgery Fellowship at Stanford. I'm now medical director of the Breathe Institute where I utilize myofunctional therapy as the first line treatment for sleep and breathing issues in pediatric and adult patients. The objective of this presentation is to explore the impact of ankyloglossia or tongue tie on potential clinical implications. It's well appreciated that tongue tie can affect things like breastfeeding, speech, and swallow function, but it may not be as readily appreciated how tongue tie can affect something like mouth breathing, snoring, maxillofacial development, and myofascial dysfunction. In this presentation, I will present the recent peer-reviewed literature, as well as preliminary case reports and case series from my ongoing research to help identify many of these points. The concept of performing a phrenectomy for tongue tie is far from new. Here is a woodblock of a physician performing a phrenectomy dating back to 1679. Ankyloglossia is a condition of restricted tongue mobility that is due to the presence of restrictive tissue between the undersurface of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. The restriction to the tongue mobility may be caused by a short mucosal frenulum or it can also be caused by restrictive myofascial fibers as well as elements of the genioglossus muscle that are fibrosed and impair optimal tongue mobility and oral functions. Recent research challenges the popular concept of what is a tongue tie. Commonly, a tongue tie is assumed to be a mucosal and fascial band that is tethering the tongue to the floor of the mouth. However, new research shows that there is a broad variability in terms of the attachments of the tongue to the floor of the mouth and that a tongue tie is not necessarily a discrete midline connective tissue but rather a web of tissue between the tongue and the floor of the mouth. This web of tissue may be composed of mucosa, mucosa and fascia, or mucosa, fascia, and elements of the genioglossus muscle. The presentations of these patients vary significantly depending on the attachment site as well as the morphological components. Clearly, the untethered mobility of the tongue is required for optimal speech, chewing, swallow, and oral hygiene. If the tongue is tethered to the floor of the mouth, and you can't move your tongue, how are you going to produce adequate speech? How are you going to move the food bolus from side to side? And clearly, it's going to impact the swallow as well as the ability of the tongue to clean food from the teeth. What I'm going to be focusing on today is the role of the tongue in breathing. And in discussing this, I understand that this may be a little controversial. So before I go on with my explanation, I want to encourage you all to please maintain perspective. Recognize that there are different ways of seeing the problem. The perspective that I will offer you is not one that I discovered or invented. Rather, it's one that is readily available for over a hundred years in the dental and myofunctional therapy literature. The problem is that a lot of the resources that are published on these topics are discredited as non-scientific or low-level evidence. However, there are many speech therapists, dental hygienists, orthodontists, and dentists who are actively using these principles in their everyday practice of treating patients with sleep disordered breathing. The least that we can do is take a minute and learn and explore this other perspective. When we're talking about myofunctional therapy for sleep and breathing, what we are talking about is the importance of having the tongue up in the palate, 
the importance of maintaining the lips in a closed position and encouraging healthy breathing through the nose. These are the precepts of a myofunctional approach to sleep and breathing. Tongue up, lips closed, healthy breathing through the nose. The concept is that the tongue should be positioned high at the roof of the mouth at rest to maintain optimal airway function and facial development. When the tongue is up on the palate, this will ensure nasal breathing and help to promote a broad development of the maxillofacial skeleton. When the tongue is held down because of tongue tie or other issues, the tongue does not function well as a palate expander and these patients tend to suffer from problems of oral myofascial dysfunction. We want the tongue to rest up, up in the roof of the mouth. Ideal tongue position is with the tongue up in the roof of the mouth. Not only the tip of the tongue, but the entire body of the tongue up touching the palate. We also, we also want our patients to have good tongue tone. Here is an example of a weak and low tone tongue in a patient on whom I've already performed a lingual frenuloplasty. As you can see in this video, the patient has significant difficulty holding up the tongue even while she is awake. We can only imagine what happens as she goes to sleep, as she goes from light sleep to deep sleep, and the tongue relaxes. Go ahead and open for me. Lift up your tongue. And open your mouth wide. Stick out your tongue. Point your tongue. Barely able to keep her tongue up during the day, we can only imagine what happens as she goes from light to deep sleep and all the muscles in the body relax. The tongue is one of those muscles and a tongue that is already in a low position has a greater likelihood of potentially obstructing the airway. Myofunctional therapy aims to help treat these patients by first promoting exclusive nasal breathing. So myofunctional therapy's first goal is to make sure the patient can breathe through the nose. And this can involve therapeutic exercises, nasal saline rinses, as well as surgical interventions. The next step is to strengthen and tone the muscles of the tongue and oral facial complex. And finally, we help the patient recognize and achieve ideal resting oral posture so that they can habituate these goals throughout their lives. I was fortunate to be invited to participate as a co-author in this study by Dr. Macario Camacho, which is a meta-analysis on myofunctional therapy to treat obstructive sleep apnea. This meta-analysis demonstrates that the therapy can actually reduce the apnea hypopnea index by 50% in adults and 62% in children with improvements to daytime sleepiness and snoring, and it's been shown to be effective in children and adults of all ages, and that it also plays a very important role in preventing relapse. This is a more recent review of the use of myofunctional therapy in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, and the review discusses the recent peer-reviewed literature demonstrating that oral myofunctional therapy can reduce the severity of snoring and sleep apnea in adults, that it is helpful in the treatment of children with residual sleep apnea, that it helps improve CPAP compliance, as well as its role in preventing relapse among patients who have already been cured or treated for sleep apnea with surgical or orthodontic interventions. While myofunctional therapy is a great tool, there are a lot of patients who will not be able to benefit from myofunctional therapy because of physical restrictions in the tongue mobility that interfere with the goals of myofunctional therapy to have the tongue up in the roof of the mouth. Now we're going to take a look at a few case studies. 
Here we have a case of a three-year-old girl with a very severe grade four tongue tie. She presents to us with speech problems, trouble chewing, trouble swallowing, but in addition, she's also found to have open mouth breathing and sleep disturbances. Here's a video of the patient sleeping prior to her tongue tie surgery. You see that she's mouth breathing with the lips apart, the tongue in a low position, and the breathing is noisy in quality. Four days after the procedure, the mother sent us this video. The video shows that she's breathing through her nose with her lips together, and the breathing is quiet in quality. This case report has been published and is available for you open access online. If you'd like to see the entire video with the parent's testimonial, please click the blue video icon link. This case teaches us that in order to breathe through the nose, two requirements have to be fulfilled. Number one, you need to have a patent nasal passage. But number two, you also need to have the back of the tongue lift to make contact with the palate in order to direct airflow away from the oral breathing route towards the nasal root. When the tongue is in a high position, up in the roof of the mouth, as seen in the first picture, the only route of breathing that is possible is exclusive nasal breathing. When the tongue is in a low position, mouth breathing prevails. Here is another example of a patient with a grade four tongue tie. This patient is a predominant mouth breather. The tongue is held down and the back of the tongue is prevented from making a seal with the palate to seal off the oral cavity from the oral pharynx. When the patient wants to breathe through the nose, he has to lift up the back of the tongue. However, in lifting up the back of the tongue, in order to nasal breathe, this requires a lot of effort. Patients will tell us that they can breathe through their nose, that they do have nasal patency, but it, it, that it is challenging and that it is a lot easier for them to breathe through the mouth. We characterize this problem as habitual mouth breathing and distinguish it from organic nasal obstruction. The natural position for the tongue is up in the roof of the mouth. Here is an example of an infant with ankyloglossia. We see that the tongue is held down. When the tongue is held down, this will block the posterior airway. The patients will present with positional sleep, sleeping on the side, as well as mouth breathing. Here is another case study of a child's progression from birth to six years in which we see low tongue posture resulting in mouth breathing that by as early as six months of age is noisy breathing and later develops into snoring and sleep apnea. I encourage you to click the video to watch this entire progression that the mother provided and put on YouTube to help get answers for problems that she was expecting all along. This child now has an x-ray and the x-ray shows large tonsils and adenoids. However, the problem began with mouth breathing. The mouth breathing induced local inflammation that led to tonsillar enlargement, worsening nasal breathing, contributing to more inflammation, postural maladaptations in terms of how she learns to hold her tongue, how she learns to chew and swallow, which then contributes to abnormal oral facial growth with a narrow maxilla that further perpetuates. And so we learn that sleep disorder breathing is actually on a continuum that ranges from mouth breathing to noisy breathing to snoring to sleep apnea. And if we're able to identify these issues early, 
when it's just mouth breathing or noisy breathing, it will be a lot more effective to treat these patients before the oral facial and tonsillar sequelae of mouth breathing affect the patient. We want the tongue to rest up in the roof of the mouth. When the tongue is up in the roof of the mouth, this will help to grow the upper jaw. When the tongue has optimal mobility, it will be able to rest up in the roof of the mouth. When the tongue is up in the roof of the mouth, it will work well as a scaffold for the maxillary arch. The dentition will come in a broad U-shaped pattern. When the tongue assumes a low position, either because of tongue tie or other myofascial restrictions, the tongue does not work well as a natural palate expander, and these patients commonly present with dental crowding, narrow arches that take a V-shaped configuration. Here are some examples of mild, moderate, and severe dental crowding that are commonly present in patients with V-shaped high arch narrow palates. When we look at our CT scans for our septums and sinuses, it's very clear to see the septal deviation. However, one thing that we miss is assessment of the tongue position. In this example, we see that the tongue has a low tongue position. It's away from the roof of the mouth. When the tongue it sits in a low position, it actually affects the development of the maxilla. The maxilla will grow narrow and highly arched. This will result in a narrow nasal cavity. Here is an article by a physician that was published in an orthodontic journal demonstrating the impact of a high arch palate in contributing to deviations of the nasal septum. More recently, in 2017, I collaborated with Dr. Audrey Yoon, who is a pedodontist and orthodontist, as well as other colleagues at Stanford, including Dr. Guillemino and Dr. Stanley Liu, to determine whether altered tongue mobility could affect development of the maxillary arch. In this study, we took measurements of tongue mobility and compared it to the ratio of the maxillary canine width to arch length. This is a measurement that helps us understand to what degree the maxillary arch takes a V versus U shape. The study shows an association between restricted tongue mobility, as in the grade three and grade four TRMR on this graph, with diminished values for the maxillary canine width to arch length. These numbers suggest that restrictions in tongue mobility are more likely to be associated with a V-shaped maxillary arch. This study supports the hypothesis that when the tongue is in a high position, that the teeth will come in in a broad U-shaped pattern. The study supports that when the tongue is low because of tongue tie reasons, that the palate will develop with a V-shaped configuration. Restricted tongue mobility accounted for 7.6% of the variance in the narrowness of the maxillary arch in the study. As such, we recognize that other factors that affect the development of the maxillary arch may include things such as mouth breathing, oral habits, tongue tone, oral rest posture, nutrition, chewing, swallowing, as well as other genetic and environmental factors. Nevertheless, we learn and the hypothesis is supported that restricted tongue mobility is associated with a narrow V-shaped maxillary arch. So how does tongue tie have anything to do with sleep apnea? Well, we learned in the Guillemino musculoskeletal hypothesis that mouth breathing leads to local inflammation that can affect the tonsils as well as contribute to abnormal oral facial growth. What I've learned since working with Dr. Guillemino and my work in the field of myofunctional therapy and lingual frenuloplasty is that patients with tongue tie commonly present with low tongue posture 
among other features of oral myofascial dysfunction. The low tongue posture leads to mouth breathing. The mouth breathing leads to snoring. That leads to sleep apnea according to the cycle of the guillaumino musculoskeletal hypothesis. We have to be clear that tongue tie is only one cause of low tongue position and that there are many other causes and explanations for why the tongue may sit in a low position. For example, chronic mouth breathing due to nasal obstruction will also cause a low tongue posture. Low tongue tone, fascial restrictions, maladaptive habit, among other myofunctional disorders may also contribute to low tongue position. Even then, the tongue tie is only the tip of the iceberg. It's more about the tongue posture than about the tongue tie. However, if the patient has a tongue tie, it will require a much more effort to have normal function. When we release these tongue ties, we see that the patient is better able to achieve optimal oral function as well as optimal oral resting posture that is necessary for the ideal development of the maxillofacial skeleton and breathing function. Sometimes tongue ties are obvious and other times they are not so obvious. On the examples on the left, we see very clear examples of anteriorly restricted tongue ties. On the examples on the left, the patient can lift up the front of the tongue. However, the mobility of the back of the tongue is impaired. The Kotlow free tongue measurement has been used since 1999 to help define the presence of a restrictive lingual frenulum. This measurement takes an assessment of the free tongue length from the end of the frenulum to the tip of the tongue. If this measurement is less than three millimeters, it's considered a complete ankyloglossia. A normal range of free tongue mobility is considered to be greater than 16 millimeters. According to this scale, which has been validated in ages 18 months to 14 years, the first diagram is clearly a severe tongue tie. However, the tool does not identify the middle image as having restrictions in the tongue mobility. According to the Kotlow free tongue measurement, this patient can stick out their tongue and is therefore not considered to be tongue tie. However, what we've learned is that these patients with the so-called mild to normal uh, tongue ties are actually quite severe when it comes to assessment of their tongue posture. As such, we have learned that it's not about the patient's ability to stick out the tongue. Rather, what we care about is if the patient can lift up the tongue. And we learn that the average ability to lift up the tongue is about 65 plus or minus 15. If the patient cannot lift up their tongue any more than 50% of their maximum mouth opening, this is considered to be restricted tongue mobility, and we would grade it as a grade three. If the patient cannot lift up any more than 25% of their maximum opening, that is considered a grade four, and this corresponds to the bottom 10th percentile. We see in this image of this 50-year-old patient with severe sleep apnea, that although he has a free tongue length of 16 millimeters, he's not adequately able to lift up the tongue. And it's not only the front of the tongue that is impaired, but more so the back of the tongue. And this is a patient who has difficulty tolerating CPAP. We perform the myofunctional therapy and lingual frenuloplasty protocol on this patient. After the procedure, he has much improved tongue mobility much improved tongue mobility in the front as well as in the back. We can see that he's able to achieve what we call a lingual palatal suction with much more ease, and this directly translates into improved nasal breathing and improved CPAP tolerance. Here are the results of his pre and post sleep study. 
showing a decrease in the AHI from about 30 down to 18.2 with the most dramatic difference during the REM stages of sleep. In addition, the patient reports feeling more rested, that he's dreaming, and that CPAP feels a lot easier to use. Indeed, myofunctional therapy has been shown to improve adherence to continuous positive airway pressure. The way this treatment works is that the tongue is transferred from a low resting position to a high resting tongue position. We are doing studies in my clinic with pre and post operative sleep studies as well as pre and post operative CT scans to distinguish which patients are those most likely to succeed from this intervention. What we are learning is that patients with low resting tongue posture that develop high resting tongue position are those that are reporting the most significant gains in the treatment protocol. This 39 year old female presented with neck and shoulder tension, breathing issues, open mouth breathing, tension headaches and bruxism. After the intervention, she reported dramatic improvements to her nasal breathing, better posture, less muscle tension, headaches, and that she was no longer grinding. Please note that it, when the tongue is in a low resting tongue position, it's much more difficult to seal off the oral cavity from the oral pharynx. And this is a patient that will mouth breathe and snore throughout the night. Here is another video that I would like you guys to click on the blue camera to access. This patient is, has a tongue tie that's tied all the way to the tip. And the patient explains how he's had this for his whole life, how it's affected his speech, swallow, his posture, but also his mouth breathing. He reports that when he's sleeping, his mouth unintentionally opens up. We have seen this in many cases. I've none, now done over 1,600 cases, and I published my first 348 in this paper just last year. The study includes authors from multiple disciplines, including dental hygiene, dentistry, orthodontics, oral maxillofacial surgery, ENT, myofunctional therapy, sleep medicine, as well as physical therapy. It was a tremendous effort to collaborate and understand how this treatment is working. And we were also able to learn how to best select our patients. The study shows that our protocol of myofunctional therapy and lingual frenuloplasty was associated with high rates of patient satisfaction with improvements to mouth breathing, muscle tension, snoring, as well as clenching and grinding. The intervention includes one month of myofunctional therapy preoperatively, the procedure, and then two months of therapy post-op. The tables from the manuscript are provided in this slide, showing high rates of patient satisfaction, improvements of quality of life. We can see the benefits attributed to lingual frenuloplasty, as well as the risks and complications. I encourage you to click on the blue paper icon to download the manuscript so you have access to it in its entirety. Patients in our series had dramatic improvements to their mouth breathing, snoring, clenching and grinding, as well as objective improvements in their sleep apnea. I encourage you guys to click on these two sets of videos to help hear from some of the subjective reports from our patients. Whereas the vast majority of patients had some improvements after the myofunctional therapy and lingual frenuloplasty, there were a number of patients who did not improve and some who frankly got worse after this intervention. We carefully followed up these cases and examined them in detail to come up with the following list of criteria to look for in terms of when tongue tie surgery is not the appropriate treatment for your sleep apnea patient. In order for tongue tie surgery to be successful, the patient must have nasal patency. If the patient's nasal cavity is obstructed, the tongue will inherently sit in a low position and the tongue tie intervention will be futile. In addition, 
the patient needs to have adequate space in their palate for their tongue. If the palate is very narrow, the tongue tie surgery will not help the tongue reach the roof of the mouth because the tongue simply cannot fit in that small space. In addition, we had some cases in which the sleep apnea symptoms got worse after this procedure, and this was in the cases of patients with significant mandibular deficiency and limited retrolingual airway space on retrospective review. We also determined that patients with low tongue tone or apraxia may not be the best candidates for this intervention, as well as if they do not have uh, adequate compliance with the myofunctional therapy. Because of the amazing collaborative work with our colleagues, we are now able to provide level three evidence in support of lingual frenuloplasty and myofunctional therapy. However, we recognize certain limitations in the study, especially as it was a retrospective, uncontrolled cohort study without objective measurements. However, this preliminary study has provided us with the knowledge necessary in order to perform controlled studies with objective measurements. I hope that I've been able to introduce you guys to the concept of ankyloglossia with a new, fresh set of eyes. When it comes to these concepts, you are never too young to learn and never too old to change. I do offer learning opportunities uh, online um, as well as in my clinic for those who are interested in learning more about uh, these interventions. With that said, I still recognize that there will be some controversy about the topics that I've presented, and I recognize that Dr. Kazarian has another presentation in which he will argue that there is very little evidence to support uh, the treatments that I've discussed. He will make an argument for the need of more objective scientific evidence before we can consider this treatment modality to be appropriate for our patients. My rebuttal to that is that we are actively working with the myofunctional therapy community internationally to collect and organize this evidence. Our initial 2019 paper shows safety and discusses the efficacy and is the largest, most systematic, and multidisciplinary exploration of these topics published to date. The knowledge that we gain there is going to be used to do objective prospective studies including pre- and post-operative home sleep studies and CBCT scans. I agree that we need this objective scientific evidence, and we're doing all that we can to take intelligent steps to build out the scientific foundation of this functional approach to sleep and breathing. We absolutely welcome any support and any constructive criticism along the way. Your feedback from the ISS community will be essential to propel this research initiative forward. We are collaborating with a variety of groups throughout the world, including the AAPMD, AOMT, AMS, the IAOM, ICAP, as well as the Breathe Institute. Here is a listing of the collaborators from the American Academy of Physiologic Medicine and Dentistry. You will see that we have representatives from all over the world, including Norway, Australia, Canada, United States, UK, and we are all working together to specifically bring research into a myofunctional approach to airway health. When I was in fellowship with Dr. Robson Capasso, I was invited to write the last chapter in this book on sleep apnea and snoring. The chapter is about innovations in the treatment of sleep apnea. In the last paragraph, of the last chapter of this book, I argued that our surgical community should think about better ways to improve efficacy, outcomes, access to care, patient experience. I really want to thank you for your interest and attention. I'm quite honored to be able to present this material to the International Surgical Sleep Society, and I look forward to further collaborations. Here are the list of the references that I included for this presentation and I welcome you to reach out with any further questions or comments.